This video is supported by Skillshare. Quasars are incredible. Now, before we get into quasars, though, I want to take just a second and talk about that word, incredible. What does that mean? The root of that word, credible, means worth believing. So if you're somebody that doesn't lie, if you're somebody that can be trusted, if you're an expert in a field, per se, then you are a credible person. And the prefix in means not. So if something is not edible, it's inedible. If somebody is not sane, they're insane. If something is not flammable, it's inflammable. Excuse me, one second. Hello? Inflammable means flammable. <laughs> what? Who is this? Hello? Hello? That was weird. Anyway, uh, incredible does mean not credible because generally when you put the N in front of the word, it means that it's the opposite of what the root of the word is. So when you put N in front of credible, um, excuse me, just one second, hi. Son of a b Inflammable means flammable. It's incredible. The point is, if you want to use the word incredible, nothing fits the definition of that word better than quasars. Quasars are incredible because they're too big, too bright, and just too massive to exist. As the most famous eyebrows in astrophysics once said, they are the unicorns of space. He's not wrong. From Earth, quasars look just like stars, but they're super not. They're insanely far away, they are incredibly bright, and they emit these jets of subatomic particles that are just beyond the scope of our imaginations. According to the best theories we've got, at the heart of every quasar is a supermassive black hole. And around that supermassive black hole is an accretion disk of hot gaseous plasma about the size of a galaxy. It is literally like a galaxy-sized star. And as this galaxy worth of gas gets close to the black hole, it releases unimaginable amounts of energy. Some quasars that we've studied out there have over a thousand times more energy coming out of it than all the stars in our galaxy combined. But again, they're so far away from us that to us, they just look like a star. And that kind of immensity in the universe is something we've only been able to even contemplate for like the last 50 years. Around the year 1514 AD, Copernicus challenged the notion that the Earth was the center of the universe. In 1771, Charles Messier published a catalog of astronomical objects that included what we now know of our galaxies. But to them, galaxies were a type of nebula, just a blob in the sky, a part of the Milky Way. By the 1920s, this was starting to be called into question. There was a famous debate in 1926 between two leading astronomers, Harlow Shapley and Heber Curtis, about the size of the universe. Shapley argued that the whole light show fit inside of our own Milky Way, and Curtis disagreed. He thought the universe was much bigger, and that there may be other galaxies out there, but he didn't have conclusive proof at the time. And most of science at the time was split along these lines. But it wasn't until 1929 when Edwin Hubble was able to prove that galaxies existed outside of our Milky Way as vast, independent groupings of stars. He was able to prove that the astronomical object Messier 31 was way further away than it should have been possible, 2.5 million light years away. Now the Milky Way galaxy we know is only 200,000 light years across, so there's no possible way that this was a part of our galaxy. This was a galaxy of its own. N31 also went by a different name at the time, the Andromeda Nebula. Today, it's known as the Andromeda Galaxy. By the way, Hubble was able to prove this with the help of a computer. How he had a computer back in 1926, you may be asking? Well, that's because his computer was named Henrietta Swan Leavitt. Leavitt worked at the Harvard College Observatory, and her job was literally to compute things. She was a human computer. This was a job back then. If you ever wondered how people did things without computers, that's how. We had people to compute that for us. We had to figure it out ourselves. So many astronomical departments, researchers, engineers had their own computer department, which was just a room full of people with slide rules. And those people were often women. But Henrietta Swan Leavitt worked with Edwin Hubble, and in doing so, she got to do some groundbreaking science. She actually came up with the method of standard candles that's used to this day to measure distances across the universe. She figured out the mathematical relationship between the pulses of certain stars and their brightness. So if you could measure the pulse of a star, then you could tell how bright it was. And if you knew how bright it was, you could tell how far away it was. So stars with a known brightness are called standard candles. And on top of being a woman in a male-dominated world, she was also deaf and was able to achieve all this stuff. And her work was nominated for a Nobel Prize. 
So now we knew that there were galaxies outside of ours, and over the coming years we found many, many more of them. But we were also finding something else, these sort of radio blobs. They only existed in the radio range, and they kind of shined like a star, and kind of didn't. So they became known as quasi-stellar radio sources. These remained a mystery until 1963, when a Dutch astronomer named Martin Schmidt took a look at readings from a quasi-stellar radio source, 3C273, and saw something familiar. 3C273 was cataloged in 1959. It was named that because it was the 273rd object recorded in the third Cambridge catalog of radio sources. Its light spectra was collected in 1962 by a British astronomer named John Bolton. He took advantage of the moon passing in front of it, known as an occultation, to get a clean spectrograph of the light. Now, if you're not familiar with astronomical spectroscopy, I will just put a link right here to a crash course video that explains it really well, but it basically allows us to kind of break apart the light, and when you do that, you find these sort of emission lines, which are unique to each element. It's sort of like the fingerprint of each element. So you can take the spectroscopy of a star or even a planet, and by seeing those emission lines, you can tell what it's made of. The point is they took a spectrograph of 3C273 and, um, yeah, they couldn't tell what it was made of. It didn't match any known element, and you know at this point they were freaking out. Could it be bad data? Could it be an element that we'd never heard of before? Could it be unobtainium? These were the readings that Martin Schmidt got his hands on, and he noticed that if you, in his words, squinted just right, it kind of looked like hydrogen shifted over 15.8%. And it was shifted over into the red, or red shifted, because something had caused this light to stretch. That something was space itself. So we gotta bounce back to Edwin Hubble and, and Henry S. Swan leave it for just a second, because they had already blown our minds by showing that there were other galaxies out there in the universe, but they were not even close to being done. Using their standard candle method that they had devised, they were actually able to determine that these galaxies that we were now finding all over the universe all seemed to be moving away from us. Except Andromeda, actually, but that's a whole other thing. The universe was expanding, and at a constant rate. And this meant so many things. Not only was the universe not static, which was an argument that was being had for centuries at that point, but it had a beginning. Because if you wound the clock backwards for billions of years, all that matter in the universe comes together. We had a big bang. It's really hard to overstate exactly how much Hubble's research changed the way that we see the universe. It changed it completely. It's no wonder that they named a telescope after him. And if you're wondering, there is a telescope named after uh, Henrietta Swan Leavitt. It's at the McDonnell Observatory here in Texas. And this is why that 15.8% redshift was such a big deal. Martin Schmidt was able to do the math and plug in the expansion rate and figure out that that light was coming from something 2.5 billion light years away. To cross that much space and still be that visible, Schmidt determined that this must have been the brightest object they had ever seen. This was a whole new thing. A superheated cloud of hydrogen shining brighter than a billion suns from billions of years ago. And quasi-stellar radio source was shortened to quasars. And since then, millions of them have been found. In fact, 3C273 is nowhere near the oldest or brightest that we've seen. Now, just in case you're having trouble conceptualizing exactly how bright quasars are, uh, consider the star Vega. It's the fifth brightest star in our sky, and it's about 25 light years away, cosmically speaking, not too far away. But if the quasar 3C273 was where Vega is right now, it would shine as brightly as our sun. No sleep for you! But that superheated plasma around the black hole that shines so brightly, that's not even the brightest part of a quasar. Because a lot of this superheated plasma gets kind of twisted up into the poles and radiated out in insanely bright jets. And there are various theories as to why this happens. A lot of physicists believe that there is sort of like a twisting motion uh, in the gravitational field of the quasar that kind of forces it up to the poles and flings it out. Now, whether it's the matter itself being dragged up to the poles and flung out, or whether it's the actual space around it being twisted by intense gravitational fields, uh, that is definitely up for debate. But you might be wondering, are there any quasars out there that have that jet pointed right at us? Yes, there are, and we have a name for it. Blazars. Blazars! But seriously, blazars are the brightest objects in the universe. In fact, their beams are so bright, they seem to break the laws of physics. They seem to go superluminal, faster than the speed of light. This is an effect called relativistic beaming, where the plasma that is generating the light is traveling so fast that it almost catches up to the light that it's emitting. And this creates a transverse velocity effect that, from the perspective of the viewer, seems to be going faster than the speed of light. 
Now conversely, this means that the jet going in the opposite direction is traveling so fast that it's invisible to us. As you can see in this picture, Messier 87, a quasar photograph by the Hubble Space Telescope, ejects a visible jet in our direction. But there's also a jet moving the other way. We can't see it because the light emitting particles don't reach us, and without the relativistic beaming effect, the jet's just too dim to make out in the visible spectrum. How's your brain doing? Is it melted? Is it like mine? Is it melted? I'm done. Of course, considering how far away these objects are and how long their light's been traveling, it's mostly assumed that quasars are ghosts that expended their fuel and died out a long time ago. Ghosts from a bygone era that cosmologists call the age of quasars. There was actually a period in the early universe, the first billion years or so, where quasars were everywhere. The universe was much more compact back then. Galaxies were a lot closer, so they were a lot more likely to collide and combine their supermassive black holes into these monsters. Of course, not every supermassive black hole becomes a quasar. A supermassive black hole has to have fuel in its sphere of influence to uh, create what they call an active galactic nucleus, or an AGN. And an AGN has to be sufficiently bright enough to then be considered a quasar. So clearly we're still learning things about quasars, but quasars are actually helping us to learn things about the universe. For example, we know about the expansion of the universe, I just talked about that a minute ago, but recently NASA used the light of some distant quasars to do a measure of the expansion of the universe in a new way that they'd never tried before. They looked at the light of a quasar as it passed through a distant galaxy. Or through isn't the right word. Um, around? Yeah, around. You've probably heard of gravitational lensing before. Well, that's what this galaxy did. It lensed the light from the distant quasar and split it into multiple beams. And since the beams took slightly different routes to get there, their light arrived at different times. Measurements were taken of the distance to the galaxy and the distance to the quasar through those various split beams. Uh, as we know, things that are further away are traveling way faster than us. This was a way of measuring how much faster. The answer from the quasar measurements was 73 kilometers per second per megaparsec. Put another way, for every 3.3 million light years that it traveled, these objects added 73 kilometers per second to their speed. And this is interesting, but mostly because it differs from the rate of expansion that's been measured using other methods. The Planck satellite, which measured the cosmic background radiation, measured it at 67 kilometers per second per megaparsec. So it's, it's a slight difference, but it is definitely a difference. Some scientists think we're gonna need a whole new kind of physics to explain this discrepancy. So once again, quasars have trashed our confidence and left us wondering just what the hell's going on out there. Thanks, quasars. And actually that's fine. Contradictions in science are, are a good thing. They lead to new insights and, you know, just generally keep things interesting. Here's an interesting thought. In something like 4.5 billion years, the Andromeda galaxy is expected to collide with the Milky Way galaxy, creating Milkdromeda, which sounds like some kind of lactose intolerance. Now, most of the stars are expected to miss each other, but the supermassive black holes at the cores are expected to eventually merge. And when they do, they could form a quasar and maybe even feed off of our sun and what's left of the Earth meaning someday our long-since fossilized bones could be ground up atom by atom into a superheated plasma surrounding a supermassive black hole. And maybe we'll be part of that matter that gets spun up into a relativistic jet, and we'll be speeding across the cosmos so fast that we'll be riding right alongside the photons that we're emitting, riding a beam of energy across the infinite universe. Now that's what I call going out like a bouse. By the way, this photo that I showed earlier of Messier 87, uh, it's a pretty cool picture, right? But that, like most space pictures, took a lot of work. Not only is this a collage of many different pictures, but it's also false color. You know, that jet that you're seeing there, that's radio waves, that's not visible light. But that's the power of photo editing, to bring ideas and images to life. And you can learn this power and apply it to your own photographs through the Fundamentals of Photo Editing course on Skillshare. This class is taught by photographer Justin Bridges, and he shows how he uses Lightroom to turn his photos into inspiring works of art using basic techniques and concepts that anybody can learn. I mean, let's face it, we all have pretty decent cameras on our phones. Great photography isn't about the camera you carry anymore. It's about what you can do to it after the photo snapped. Or in Justin's words, he'll help you capture in your photo what you were feeling when you took it. This is one of hundreds of classes you can take on Skillshare, taught by professionals from all around the world, including more courses on photography, video and filmmaking, but also graphic design, entrepreneurship, music, creative writing, productivity, web development, marketing. I think you get the idea. The first 500 people that sign up to Skillshare at my link down below get two months for free. Just think about all you can learn in two months. You could be a Bond villain or something. And after that, if you still have an insatiable lust for knowledge, uh, you can sign up for their annual subscription. It's $10 a month. 
totally worth it. So join the millions who are exploring their creativity, starting businesses, and just generally becoming more awesome using Skillshare. Links down in the description below. Big thanks to Skillshare for supporting this video and a huge shout out to the answer files on Patreon that are helping me to grow a team and make this thing more awesome every day and you're forming an awesome community. I love you guys. Uh, there's some new people. Let me murder their names real quick. We got Robert Bergman. Welcome back, Robert. Uh, Chris Marino, Fritz Smith, Mark Everett, Michael Cavanaugh, Martin Caldwell, John Portzer, Fargus Plumdoodle of the uh, Minnesota Plumdoodles, uh, Clyde Clark, and Jamie Wallace. Thank you guys so much. If you'd like to join them, get early access to videos, and just get to know some amazing people, you can go to patreon.com slash answerswithjoe. T-shirts available at the store, answerswithjoe.com slash store. There's also hoodies, shirts, posters, stickers, mugs. I got a pretty sweet mug. It's just not here. Uh, but uh, there, there are lots of fun. People will see them. They'll comment on them. You'll make friends, uh, and it helps support the channel. So uh, answerswithjoe.com slash store. Have fun. Please do like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, maybe check this one out because Google thinks you'll like that one or any of the others with my face on them. And uh, if you like them, I do invite you to subscribe. I come back with videos every single Monday. All right, that's it. Thanks again for watching. You guys go out now, have an eye-opening week, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.